So I'm happy to be here with all of you. And I'll speak on this topic of spirituality in the age of science. We have phenomenal amount of technological progress in the world today. Luxuries that were unimaginable even for royalty a few hundred years ago are commonplace today. Air conditioning is one example. And yet there seems to be something which is causing immense distress to people. We are immensely comfortable at a physical level and yet we are immensely distressed at the mental level. So we could say the mind is attacking the body. The World Health Organization says that mental health is the biggest health challenge of the current century. <coughs> and the global suicide count in the world is one million per year. That means more than the number of people who are being killed by others are the number of people who are killing themselves. More than the number of people who are killed in uh, violence, in murders. Nowadays we have, in America there's a big concern about gunmen shooting in schools and colleges. But more than the count of all this is the number of people who are killing themselves. So the mind can attack the body in various ways. It can attack the body by making people do get into unhealthy habits, addictions. But the extreme ways the mind attacks, not only attacks the body, but destroys the body. That is, when a person is impelled to commit suicide. So now, what exactly is happening over here? Now, as mental health problems are increasing, there is also an attempt to treat it scientifically. So the overall flow of my talk will be that there is a problem that is present in spite of technological progress. And science is trying to address that problem also. But the solution or the way the problem is being addressed is actually in many ways making things worse. So when mental health problems are there, many people go to psychiatrists. So now, the, since 1960, 1960 was the first time uh, when the idea of a tranquilizer or antidepressant that came up. This kind of medicine itself was not there before that. And then from that time onwards till now 60 years later, now antidepressants and tranquilizers are the biggest sole medicine in over the counter. And the budgets of some of the pharma giants which manufacture antidepressants and mental health medicines, the budgets are bigger than the budgets of several European countries. So there's huge amount of money involved over there. Uh, so while there is an attempt to treat the mental health problems at the level of psychiatric medicine, there are several books written. So this is a science journalist and scientist James Davis, himself psychiatrist. He wrote this book called Cracked. Why psychiatry why is doing more harm than good. Now, as I move forward, I'll talk about where psychiatry can help and where it cannot help. But before we go forward, let's look at what was the problem. Why would somebody, somebody a scientist, make this kind of claim that there is some problem with psychiatry? So in the history of psychiatry, there were several experiments. So Rosenhan experiment was one, and then the diagnostic reliability experiments were another. So what was this Rosenhan experiment? That there was this researcher Rosenhan. He asked several people who were actually themselves doctors to go to mental health care centers, to psychiatrists, and tell them that I am hearing a thud in my head. Periodically, like thud. I just keep hearing sounds in my head. And apart from that, they would act perfectly normal. And that was the only lie they told. And the result was that all these people, they had about uh, se uh, several dozen of them, they were in different hospitals. All of them were admitted into the psychiatric hospitals and they were given heavy treatments, heavy drugs. And as those drugs were extremely heavy, they were themselves doctors, they knew what was happening with these drugs. They tried to tell them, actually, we don't need these drugs, we're simply doing an experiment. Now, this 
made the medical staff treat them as further mad <laughs> and they were when the more they tried to oppose the more intense were the drugs given and the only way they could get out of the out of the uh, mental health care homes was by pretending that they were sick and they were being healed and when they came out and when they tell told the story of what happened it created a furor and rosenham was accused of misleading the doctors and one of the hospitals uh, my chief doctor said that you know you try this again we were caught unaware next time if we will be able to catch and we'll detect people who are uh, pretending and in one month later this doctor announced that we caught over 30 people <laughs> who were hoaxes sent by this doctor and this doctor said i didn't send anyone <laughs> so this just indicated that the sane people might be deemed as insane and they would be given medicines which would have some serious side effects in another case this was the diagnostic reliability experiment we had done by another set of doctors they had a set of five patients go to they take five they all describe the five symptoms you know i'm not able to sleep at night i get heart palpitations i get fearful images fear some images in my head they they all describe five symptoms a set of symptoms to five different doctors and all of them diagnose these patients separately every one of them was diagnosed a separate di disorder and everyone was prescribed a different medication and they repeated it several times at different places but this problem forget to got repeated so now the reason for this is that mental health disorders as they are diagnosed to psychiatry they don't have any specific uh, pathogen there is no germ there is no microbe that is causing it so the level of objectivity which we can get in this diagnosis is much lesser and of course since then psychiatry has tried to systematize itself they try to uh, they try to have a diagnostic and statistical manual which would decide if these symptoms are there that this is the diagnosis these symptoms are there this is the diagnosis but on what basis is decided so for example uh, now they say that if you have five symptoms associated with depression for over 2 weeks then you are diagnosed as clinically depressed now why five symptoms why not six why not two weeks why three weeks this was simply decided based on the discretion of those who wrote the manual there's another case where they found that in canada there were kids uh, just small kids uh, just getting into kindergarten or first first grade second grade they found that it seemed that adhd uh, <coughs> attention hyperactivity disorder the kids who were born later in the year the percentage of them having this disorder was much more than those born in the beginning of the year so if a kid was born in december the percentage of that kid having uh, the probability of that person having adhd was almost three times more than a kid born in january and this is almost a linear graph increasing and they started wondering what what is what is the month of birth got to do with somebody being diagnosed with adhd and then as they did further investigation they found actually what was called was adhd adhd was simply that the academic year for the kid they started in january so for a kid who was born in january they would at that age have almost a one years advantage over a kid who was born in december and because of that the child would have greater learning capacity so a child who had greater learning capacity was able to learn very nicely the child who couldn't learn nicely that child started getting restless and he couldn't understand couldn't learn and become restless and he was diagnosed as having adhd so the point here is not to deny that there are mental health problems we all have there are it's a huge number but there is a problem with trying to pathologize these problems pathologize means think that every or any emotional or behavioral or psychological problem can be dealt with simply by giving medicines 
this uh, why is there a problem with this now what do we understand about consciousness when now the idea of being depressed the idea of having uh, emotions that are negative having anxiety disorders in all these it is our emotions that are going haywire and when these emotions are going haywire all this is happening in the realm of consciousness so now what is consciousness till we understand this our attempts to heal the consciousness are often shots in the dark so roger sperry is a nobel laureate neuroscientist and he is talking about consciousness and he is given two distinct models he talks about two there's one a bottom mod model and the other is a top down model so he gives a simple example to illustrate this suppose we are observing a house from outside and then there is a garage and in that garage there is a car and then as we observe the car starts moving and the car starts moving and it comes out on the road and it goes straight off now we may decide what made this car move i could go up and i could say that oh the car moved because the wheels started were moving why were the wheels moving oh because the axle exerted energy on the uh, wheels and that's why they happened why did that happen you go back 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 at the mechanical change oh there was a few, uh, the engine that was ignited started off there's a spark in the ignition the engine started off what made that start off you go up up okay there was a key that was in the vertical position that moved to the horizontal position so why did the why did the car start off that was because the key moved from the vertical to the horizontal position now that is a valid explanation it is a correct explanation. but another explanation could be the owner of the car wanted to go out for a ride now both the two explanations are not contradictory but the two explanations come from different perspectives so when we look at the motion of a car we could go from a bottom up approach we look from the wheels upwards and we come to the key or we go down from a top down approach that there's a owner is a conscious agent who wanted to drive and he moved the key from the vertical to the horizontal position he or she whoever it was and then the car started moving so most of the explanations that we get in most of the assumptions on which psychiatry works is the bottom up approach and now the bottom up approach has its validity but it also has its limitation so william james is considered the one of the fathers of psychology and he proposed this idea which subsequent science has vindicated in many ways that he said that the brain is not the originator of consciousness it is the transmitter of consciousness so if i have a ray of light falling on a prism and then it comes out from the prism so if the prism is damaged if the prism gets cracked then the light coming from it will also get distorted so now one of the main reasons why it is thought that consciousness originates from the brain is that when certain areas of the brain are damaged the corresponding bodily functions do not take place so if there's an area say, i mean particular area of the brain maybe we are not able to move our hands or legs or whatever so now this could be because consciousness originates from there it could also be because consciousness is transmitted from there so if consciousness were transmitted through the particular area of the brain which controls the motor nervous system then also what would happen is that we will not be able to function if that particular area of the brain is damaged so now psychiatry assumes that brain as i get as it functions today it assumes that the brain is the source of consciousness and by changing the chemicals in the brain we can change not only the state of the brain but also the feelings of the person there are several researches done by different uh, scientists which indicate that consciousness is not reducible to the brain one of the most well known experiments is what was done by dr wilder penfield in which is written in his book the mystery of the mind 
there he talks about how he had a subject and he told the subject raise your hand the subject raised the hand he found that the corresponding area of the brain was activated he told the subject lower the hand the and the corresponding area of the brain got deactivated and then he used external probes to activate that part of the brain and the hand went up he asked the subject what happened he said my hand went up he deactivated that part of the brain what happened his hand fell down then he asked the question had you raised the hand? he said no i didn't you did did you lower the hand no i didn't you did now penfield raises this question that this experiment raises the question who was the agent who said i raised the hand in the first case and who denied raising the hand in the second case to understand this implicate uh, to understand the implication let's consider there is a print button over here and there is a printer over here now i press the print button and the printer hand starts moving that is the first case the corresponding area of the brain is like the print button when that is activated the hand starts going up and down in the second case who press the print button because the owner the agent is saying i didn't do it but that area of the brain is like the print button so when penfield came and pressed it in the second case but first case who did it so no matter whichever other area of the brain he activated while repeating this experiment no area of the brain when activated gave the subject the feeling that i am the ray i am the agent i am the person who is doing something so based on this penfield concluded that the brain is like a computer but it is programmed from something by something outside of itself so john eccles another nobel laureate neuroscientist he said that the source of consciousness is extra cerebral it exists outside the brain so why is it important to recognize that there might be some dimension to consciousness beyond the brain because when we try to fiddle with the brain by giving chemicals that are uh, that change brain states what happens by that so this is a reductionistic model of consciousness that consciousness can be reduced down to uh, brain chemicals and brain brain states so the result of this is that the deadening of sentience so there's a case of a person you know, he he was happily married to a woman for almost 45 years and then she died suddenly and he was under his great grief so his grief went on for more than 2 weeks he was taken to a doctor and the doctor gave a medicine for grief grief is also considered to be a pathological condition now grief is just a natural human response to loss but and what happened by that he just lost all capacity to feel pain even if on the news he would see some ghastly murder some deadly brutal scene he saw a car hit a car hit a dog and a dog died on the spot he felt no pain so what happened was was this actually healing the pain he was this actually healing the grief or was this deadening was it deadening his capacity to express any emotion including grief so it's in, uh, so now conversely there are as i said the antidepressants which make people feel good they are feeling bad they feel good but how do they actually work they work by changing the state of the brain now what does it mean changing the state of the brain actually <clears throat> if we consider the bottom up approach to consciousness now we could say that what is happiness happiness is laughter if somebody is laughing then they are happy now if there is sometimes if there is a small kid child in the family relatives come to meet that child relatives come to meet the family and they want to have some fun with that child so they may start tickling the belly of that child now when the belly of the child is tickled the child may start laughing <laughs> now when the child is laughing like that is the child happy is the response of laughter produced by tickling is that happiness if that were happiness and all of us want to be happy <laughs> then all of us could have our own personal perpetual tickling machine <laughs> we could tickle ourselves for the rest of our life and be happy now we understand that tickling may produce the reaction it's a physical sensation 
which produces the physical reaction of laughter but happiness is something much deeper similarly there may be certain brain chemicals certain medicines which we may take and those inserted in the brain may alter our brain state by which we temporarily feel better but the just as smile or laughter is the result of happiness it is not the cause of happiness when i am happy i naturally smile and laugh but if i got some if somebody is very gloomy and we get a muscle get a machine which you place on the mouth and it twists the facial muscles so that is eyes big smile on the face now would that be happiness no so similarly just as the changing of the facial muscle so that it simulates a uh, smile or a laugh that is not happiness similarly changing the brain states so that it corresponds with a, a, what seems like a happy state that is not really happiness now there is a validity to it if somebody is always gloomy and dull and morose and pessimistic come on cheer up smile you may tell them you know okay say fact be confident have a good smile you'll feel better now yes this is help us to feel better but for how long now if i am sitting on this say uh, seat and there are nails on the seat and the nails are hurting me and you tell me come on cheer up smile <laughs> <laughs> how long is that going to help me <laughs> oh actually there is a external act which we may do and even doing that act may help to some extent but if there is a internal problem then that also has to be addressed so when we have distress when we have anxiety when we have depression when we have grief these are emotions which are arising from inside and just trying to address them at the level of the brain that doesn't lead to any lasting solution and that's why when people take antidepressants the result is that often they have to keep taking more and more and more and more now this is all this is to not uh, not minimize or deny that there are many diseases where psychiatric treatment is required sometimes the brain gets structurally damaged sometimes there is serious chemical imbalance in the brain and at that time psychiatric treatment can be a big blessing some people just they behave like insane as long as they don't take the medicine when they take the medicine they become they become calm so there is definitely a role and a necessity for taking psychiatric medicines but the pathologizing of normal human emotions is what becomes a serious problem why because those emotions are orig originating from somewhere higher now what is this idea of somewhere higher let's do a simple thought experiment to understand this point so wherever you're sitting you can be relaxed and you can close your eyes so please close your eyes and along with me you can take three deep breaths one let all the air from your body go out take in as much as air as you can do three now with your eyes closed look at what you see in front of you as the eyes are closed you can't see what is outside in front of you but you will see as if an inner screen on which different images may come and go you may see some objects from this room you may see a room in your own home you may see a friend a loved one you may see a, your you may see a car you may see the sky you may see various images coming and going on that inner screen or you may see just a dull colorless haze of varying intensity and shades 
on that inner screen. But irrespective of what you see specifically on that inner screen, there is an inner screen and there is, there is you who is the seer of that inner screen. There are you. So now as you are looking at the inner screen, try to take a step backwards and look at who is looking at that inner screen. Try to take a step backwards and instead of looking at the inner screen, try to take a look at who is looking at that inner screen. Try it once again. Take a step backwards and try to look at who is looking at that inner screen. No matter how many steps you take back, the inner seer steps back with you. You can't see the seer because you are the seer. You are who are the seer are a spiritual being. The inner screen is the mind. What you are looking for is what you are looking with. You can take one deep breath and then you can open your eyes. Thank you. So this thought experiment can be understood through another example. The Bhagavad Gita is an ancient yoga text and it offers a three level model of the self. It model is the body, mind and the soul which is the source of consciousness. So this is like the hardware, the software and the user. So the mind is like the inner screen. Big high security building in which there's a monitor which is at the security room and there are different doors at that in that building and each of the doors has a CCTV camera close of its closed circuit TV camera and the inputs from those doors are coming on this big monitor so that big monitor is like the mind and the cameras are like our senses. So now, <coughs> if we consider this, this model particularly, it's interesting that in neuroscience, there is something which is called as the binding problem or the integration problem. What that means is that suppose we see a parrot flying over here and we hear the parrot singing. Now, Actually, when the parrot moves from here, there are four different perceptions that are happening. There's the, sh there's the shape, there's the color, there's the motion, and there's the sound. Now, if you analyze the brain into its functions, there are different areas of the brain which, which process sound, which process shape, which process color, which process motion. And yet, we experience it as an integrated there is no one area of the brain which is connected with all other areas of the, of the brain which can take in all the inputs and integrate it. So where that integration of various inputs coming into the brain happens, that is a mystery. Now why is this integration significant? Sometimes you may on YouTube see some homemade videos or some videos which are not very well shot. So there's a mock fight going on. So they recorded the video first and then they recorded the audio sep they rec separately and they integrated the two. If the audio and video are not integrated properly, then say one, the mock fight and one boxer is punching the other boxer. And before the punch lands on the other person, the other person falls down. <laughs> and after the person falls down, then there is a sound of the punch hitting the jaw. So what happened? Sound and video are not integrated together. Now that doesn't happen to us. We see all the inputs coming from senses integrated together. So the mind is the integrator of the inputs coming from the senses. And then we the user, we the soul are the processor. So now when psychiatry pathologizes ordinary, ordinary human distresses, what is happening? It's like we are trying to fix the hardware when there is a problem in the software. 
there can be problems in the hardware and when there are problems in the hardware we do need hardware fixes but if my computer is corrupted by a virus and i just maybe let me change my keyboard keys are not typing properly or the image is not coming properly in the monitor let me change the monitor no actually a software software problem will require a software fix a hardware problem will require a hardware fix so because of the reductionistic model of the self which is prevalent in mainstream uh, science today uh, the all the problems we try to reduce them down to the hardware problems so what do i mean by a software problem i said the mind is the integrator and the presenter of inputs coming from outside it's meant to be like that but in the mind if you consider this like a big monitor on which you have five different windows is big one sometimes on a big screen you can have multiple windows open so there is the eye window there is the ear window there is the nose window there is the skin window there is the tongue window so say right now you are hearing what i am speaking so the eye window and the ear window are prominently what are open but say suddenly from the from behind the smell of some delicious food comes up then what happens the nose window zooms out <laughs> hey what is this what food is this how oh, when will i get it will there be a second helping so the mind starts going off so not only does that image zoom up but after the image zooms up it's it's not just a image it starts off a movie over there and then our thoughts go off in different directions so when this is happening this is more of a uh this is a response not so much to any sensory stimuli coming in one sensory stimuli is there but after that there is the imagination of the mind is starting off so basically uh, for us to function effectively the right window needs to zoom up and in the software in the, the mind is itself the software which integrates and presents so for all of us depending on what our particular interests are what our particular attachments are Uh, certain images will zoom up so if somebody is a alcoholic as soon as they go to a party if eyes will go is there any alcohol over here if somebody is extremely tired they go to a room they say okay where can i sleep mm-hmm. so for us depending on our disposition depending on our inclination certain zoom up and basically when there is there are mental health problems what is happening the wrong images or the unwanted images are zooming up so for example when there is anxiety related disorders then normally we should be perceiving the reality out there and responding to that however we generally don't respond to the physical reality out there we respond to the mental perception of the physical reality So if I'm in a desert and I see a mirage actually there's only sand over there but the perception within me is that there is a mirage and there is a water over there and I'll chase after it so we don't actually contact physical reality we contact only the mental representation of the physical reality and we respond to them and when these mental representations go off So, if for example, if somebody has anxiety-related disorders, then it's not anxiety is not actually necessarily a disorder. Anxiety is just a normal uh, human condition because we all live in a world of uncertainty, and uncertainty causes anxiety. If I have to catch a flight and I don't know whether I'm going to reach on time or not for the flight, I'll have anxiety. But there is anxiety which is normal in the sense that there's uncertainty. I don't know what will happen, but there's anxiety which starts becoming perpetual. so when it becomes perpetual what happens is the on the inner screen on the mind instead of the image of what is happening right now coming in front of me images of the future start coming oh this may go wrong this may go wrong that may go wrong that may go wrong that may go wrong so i get a small swelling on my hand and i start thinking oh my god what if this is cancerous and what if it is advanced cancer what if i have only few months to live oh i'm going to die soon and i will get panicky completely now what is happening 
over here there is a physical stimulus but from that physical stimulus the mind has gone on to a horror movie in the future so this is not so much a hardware problem it is more of a software problem software problem means that the mind is zooming up with unwanted images similarly the two major health problems that mental health problem that people face the two broad categories are anxiety and depression depression occurs when we uh, go into the past and keep reliving the bad things that have happened in the past and that oh this went wrong this went wrong this went wrong this went wrong and again and again we think this is what is going to go wrong again and again in future so <clears throat> when uh, for this when such a situation comes up in our life when the inner screen is giving unwanted images at that time we need uh, more to grow up spiritually than to try to find some chemicals to deal with the problems so as i said if there is actual structural damage to the brain if there is actual chemical imbalance in the brain then that is fine when we may need some psychiatric medicines but if there is the issues are more emotional or behavioral in terms of uh, over reactions to normal human distresses so we all go through grief but somebody is going through grief excessively it's not that there is a chemical indeficiency in their brain it's just that they are unable to process that emotion process that situation so now how does spirituality help us in this spiritual wisdom helps us understand that we are bigger than our situations and we are bigger than our emotions so sometimes the situation can just seem overwhelming and when the situation seems overwhelming there's practically nothing i can do so the nature of the mind is that the more we dwell on a problem the bigger it seems to become the more i dwell on it oh you know this person is treating me like this this person is neglecting me this person is rejecting me this person is hurting me the more i think about that what happens the more i feel rejected unloved unwanted uncared now okay that person may be treating me like that but sometimes when we are not getting along well with some person we say i'm not going to talk with you i'm not going to spend any time with you now we say physically i will not spend any time with you but our mind we are giving so much time to that person now why i do like that next time i do like this i'll do like this i do like that i do like that so basically this is a life determines our problems but our mind determines the size of those problems life determines the problems which we face we all have bad things happening in our life but our mind determines the size of the problems how much we obsess over it with what attitude we go on that problem that determines how big the problem is going to be so if i make a particular situation as a defining situation of my life or say i am feeling depre- i i am feeling depression right now because this went wrong that went wrong that went wrong and i start thinking you know depression is my defining emotion i am a depressed person we fix that label on ourselves then it becomes a serious problem so the spiritual understanding is spiritual knowledge gives us the understanding that we are bigger than our situations we are bigger than our emotions in life it's a long journey the materialistic world view tells us that life is like a 100 meter marathon either it's a sprint sorry 100 meter sprint either you win or you lose but spiritual knowledge helps us understand that life is like a 100 kilometer marathon even if you fall back in one lap it doesn't matter you can always catch up later you get a long term perspective and with that long term perspective we can distance ourselves rather raise ourselves above our emotions and above our situations and that can help to better respond to life's difficulties so we can process them process the problems of life better by growing up spiritually by not getting carried away by emotions but by raising ourselves above the emotions observing the emotions and then processing them so when mantra mantra is one way to spiritualize our consciousness yoga is basically not just about physical postures the physical postures are meant to help us raise our consciousness to the spiritual level so mantra is like a uh, is one means by which we can strengthen ourselves internally 
So what do we may strengthen ourselves internally? That on the inner screen, various images are going to come up. So if we have strength, okay, no, I don't want to think about this. I'll think about something else. So those images will pop up. So if we are studying for an exam and suddenly some notification comes up on a Facebook, okay, not now. You minimize it, you move forward. That requires willpower. Similarly, in our inner world, emotions will pop up. Oh, you know, this was, this went wrong, this happened, that happened, this may go wrong, that may go wrong. So if we have strength, then okay, this has come, but I don't need to pay attention to it right now. Let it be there, I'll neglect it and focus on this. So this capacity to choose which image to maximize in our internal, in our screen, and which to minimize. That intelligence, that strength, comes by spiritual growth. So it empowers us to, first of all, distance from the emotions that arise in us and then to process them appropriately. So I'll conclude with one incident, one experience which I had. When I first came to America a few years ago, I was speaking at a university and I was speaking on regulating our mental diet. It is to vegetarian society. And I spoke about how we careful about eating what we take into our body, but we have to be careful about what we take into our mind also. Because the mind just reflects what we have put on it. So after that program, one boy came to me and he told me that just before this program, he had been contemplating suicide. He had been in a relationship and uh, that girl had suddenly broken up with him. And he was, he was refusing to talk with him at all. I was very depressed. So as he was just gloomily wandering along the campus, at that time he saw a poster of this program which I was doing. So something within him said, just go for this program. And then he came for the program. He said, now I'm understanding after the pro uh, that it's not I who want to commit suicide. It is that this mind which is, this idea is popping up on my, in my mind. Come on, commit suicide, commit suicide. He said, yes, if you understand this difference between you and what is happening in your mind, and you will stay safe. So I told him, encourage him to study the Bhagavad Gita. I have a website called Gita Daily, where I write every day a 300 word meditation on the practical application of the Gita. So I encourage him to visit that and to read about the Gita regularly. So he started doing that. So every year when I come to India, America once or twice, when I go to that university, I meet him and talk with him. So he is becoming slowly spiritual. So last year when I had come, uh, he met me again and he told me that he went through a similar situation again. He had been in a steady relationship and suddenly that girl broke up with him. So he said when he got that news, he got that message on his phone, he just went straight to his room, he closed the door, pulled down the uh, closed, shut the windows, pulled down the curtains, turned off the lights and then he picked up, he, he loud music, so he picked up his violin and he started singing Hare Krishna. He said, he said, I was singing continuously for six hours. And those six hours that I was singing, he, I felt myself bathing in, a, in some kind of spiritual light. I felt myself basking in a soft presence. Those, that period, which would have been a very depressing period of my life, it was a very enriching period. I could feel the presence of some divinity. And that's how he, he felt that my spiritual conviction increased through that experience. So rather than getting depressed and getting suicidal, what happened was his spirituality helped him to process that emotion of rejection in a far more healthy way. So similarly, all of us, we may go through various negative emotions in life, but if we grow spiritually, then we will be able to cultivate more healthy responses to the negative situations of life and the negative emotions that come in our mind. So spiritual growth is a powerful way by which we can deal with the negativities of the mind. And no matter how much science and technology advance, they can provide us some facilities, they can provide us some comforts, and they are good. But 
they alone cannot substitute for our inner growth they cannot take the place of our maturation internally to better process our emotions so science can make things better but spirituality can make minds better spirituality can transform us internally and make our mind healthier and better and that's why you know matter how science how much science advances we do need spirituality in fact the more science advances we could say the more we need spirituality because through the scientific advancement and through the technological advancement the amount of distractions that the mind gets exposed to are much more than earlier and more and more pop ups come up on the inner screen and we need spiritual growth to be able to uh, process all the various stimuli that are coming in our mind and respond in a healthy way to them so i'll summarize i spoke about why we need spirituality in age of science I talked about how primarily the area of mental health mm. while lug while luxuries have become common place which were unavailable even to royalty in the past but we have mental health problems far more than before more people are killing themselves than are being killed by others mental health problems are the biggest health challenge of the current century so what is what is the way science is offering us to deal with mental health problems that is primarily through pathologizing them and offering psychiatric medicines i talked about two problematic studies one is that healthy people just by one fib i get hearing a thud in the head they were di- diagnosed as insane and the same subject was diagnosed with or the same symptoms were diagnosed differently at different times or simple behavioral problem like child children being unable to manage their studies were diagnosed as having adhd so so this pathologizing of normal human challenges that is happening because of a reductionistic view of consciousness i talked about why is a car moving because its wheels are moving because the key moved from vertical to horizontal that's a bottom up approach the top down approach is the car is moving because there is a driver who wanted to go for a ride both are true and which we need to use where has to be carefully understood so uh, current mainstream science reduces all of reality down to matter and it considers our consciousness also to be a result of brain phenomena now the brain is the transmitter of consciousness not the originator talk about dr pillar spencer's experiment of raising the hand and lowering the hand which indicated that the source of consciousness is extra cerebral and to understand this that consciousness exists beyond the brain we did this thought experiment where there is the outer outer world that we see there is the inner screen which is the mind and there is the inner sphere that is the soul so this can also be understood as the self soul is like the user the mind is like a software and the body is like the hardware so the mind is meant to be the integrator and presenter of images coming from the outer world so that we can respond to them but when this integration and presentation software malfunctions then unwanted images zoom up so in anxiety related disorders all negative images about the future zoom up in depression negative images of the past zoom up and this is because of the corruption of the software of the mind so just as a device that has software problems just fixing the hardware alone may not deal with that issue similarly fixing the brain or changing the processing or changing the chemicals in the brain that will not f- deal with software issue will the issues of mental growth and mental processing at the mental level so mm, there it can uh, taking some chemicals that alter the brain states can make us feel better but that is simply like tickling may make us feel better or just smiling may make us feel better that doesn't address the underlying issues so happiness is much deeper than what can be provided by tickling so happiness uh, so hap uh, hap smiling or laughter is a result of happiness it is not the cause of happiness so i concluded by talking about how spiritual gwent system helps us understand that we are beyond our emotion beyond our situations and beyond our emotions so by distancing ourselves from them knowing that we are secure in our spirituality we can evaluate 
our emotions and our situations more maturely and respond to them healthily so mantra is a spiritual sound vibration that raises our consciousness to the spiritual level and by this elevation consciousness help gives us strength to evaluate and respond to whatever images pop up on our inner screen i discussed the binding problem in consciousness which indicates that the greater of various inputs coming in has to be somewhere beyond the brain that is the mind so we if we grow spiritually then whatever unhealthy emotions come into us because of life's unfortunate events uh, we will be able to respond to them more healthily just as this boy who was suicidal earlier became spiritual and a similar situation came up he turned towards spirituality and became enriched rather than becoming depressed thank you very much hare krishna so are there any questions or comments Yeah, please. I was going to deal with the picture on like imitation and the imitation and the progress and then giving the mind to depress or discourage. Impatient. Okay, so if you become feel impatient about our spiritual progress, or impatient about spiritual progress itself, or what? Yeah. Okay. So, so if you feel impatient about our spiritual progress and get depressed because of that, see, if we may sometimes practice spiritual life. but we may have a material conception of spiritual life and even a material conception of spiritual growth what does that mean that in material life success is usually seen as a destination i want to climb up that mountain if i get to that mountain i am successful if i fail in getting to that mountain i am a failure so in material life you usually think of success as a destination in spiritual life more a direction than a destination uh, it success is what we are souls who are parts of the whole uh, krishna is known by different names is known name as known by the name krishna in the bhakti tradition so now it's a relationship of love between us and him and th- there is no such thing as a end to a relationship i formed a relationship that's good but the relationship is ongoing process so when we learn to see our spiritual growth more as a direct than a destination then we can set okay i would like to do this i would like to get over this i would like to um do this whatever it is what we can set no measuring our growth in terms of the direction rather than destination doesn't mean that we give up the destination but we learn to savor the journey also so actually uh say there are two kids who are going for the first time to disneyland now one of them is just so eager when will i get to disneyland when i'll get to disneyland and all along the journey that the kid is just looking at the watch looking at the window are we there are we there are we there and other kid decides okay i'm going to along this road in the first time let me enjoy the ride also so he looks around takes in the scenery sees the mountains sees the rivers sees the new buildings and is enjoying the ride Now suppose along the way the car breaks down, and they don't get to Disneyland. Now the first child will still have enjoyed the ride. The second child, the second child will have enjoyed the ride. First child would have been just miserable. So for us, if we consider spiritual growth, it is not that only on achieving certain targets we can experience inner contentment or inner joy. Even along the journey. Hmm? if we don't get too hooked this is what i want to do no there is a higher plan for our life and even our progress will be happening according to higher plan we do our best and during that process also if we learn to focus on the good we can see that there are many ways in which our spiritual growth has changes for the better there are many ways in which we are experiencing greater contentment greater purity greater clarity than before so if we learn to see spiritual growth as a direction and we are on the direction constantly and we have covered a significant distance but if we say how far i have to go if i define my spiritual success growth only in terms of having reached a particular destination then i may feel i am very far away 
but if you just focus on yes if i keep moving along if you just keep moving along trying to do what i can in a mood of devotion i am growing and even now we can experience a spiritual connection and to the extent we experience a spiritual connection to that extent there will be satisfaction in that so we don't have to necessarily think that unless i get to a particular destination i'm not growing spiritually even if we have certain conditionings which we are not able to overcome but that's okay because some conditioning may take a long time to overcome even with the conditionings also we can still connect with connect for, uh, connect with uh, spiritual reality with krishna and we can experience some spiritual satisfaction even with that if we don't fixate on particular goals in spiritual life and just focus on following the process and try to connect with krishna we will experience contentment even now okay any other comments or questions can one uh hear psychological uh conditions through spirituality alone can one cure like psych- psychological conditions through spirituality alone uh i wouldn't put psychiatry or psychology as a competitor to spirituality Mm. the point of this whole talk is that that we cannot replace spirituality with psychiatry but that doesn't mean that we are saying that psychiatry should be replaced with spirituality mm-hmm. so psychiatry and psychology are also two different things mm-hmm. psychiatry is where more medicines are prescribed psychology is where more is talk therapy mm-hmm. now you dis- you uh, sit on the psychologist coach or lie down and pour out your heart and they hear and they discuss so that is more so we could say psychiatry tries to process uh, deal with mental health issues at the physical level mm-hmm. psychology tries to deal with mental health issues at the mental level mm-hmm. spirituality deals with them by raising us above the mental level to the spiritual level mm-hmm. so it's not that this uh, spirituality will make other things redundant mm-hmm. there are situations when psychiatry may be required mm-hmm. there are situations when psychology may also be required mm-hmm. but what the concern here is that if spiritual if psychiatry is made into a replacement for spirituality mm-hmm. then that uh, pathologizing of normal human problems mm-hmm. is is a serious problem mm-hmm. we don't have to make uh, we don't ha- we don't have to make the claim at all that spirituality alone can solve all psychological or psychiatric problems mm-hmm. there are the specializations and there are committed professionals in the specializations mm-hmm. and there are times when their assistance is also needed that's perfectly fine it's this, the important thing is that we don't uh, have a distorted view of the self where we reduce the person to just their brain states or brain chemicals okay yeah. yes so when you talk of mantra meditation and uh, you get like analogy of like the mind being like a inner screen hmm. so when we are focusing on mantra meditation what should be on that inner screen okay so the mind is like the inner screen and we are chanting the mantra what should be there on the inner screen at that time basically the mantra is the way our consciousness rises upwards so we could say that if uh, this i give the example of the inner screen and the inner uh, seer that's we could say it's a horizontal example so there is a outer scene so you are looking at me i am looking at you and there is a inner screen there is a inner seer so <clears throat> normally we function that the inner screen acts like a window so that what is outside is seen and then we can respond to it properly and in this way we can respond to physical reality immediately the mantra is a spiritual sound mm. so in that sense it's at this level itself the same level the seer is there that's where the mantra is but presently we vibrate it at a physical level mm. so what we are trying to do is that when we let this physically vibrated sound appear on our inner screen 
then that awakens our spiritual awareness that activates our awareness to give another example of for this say there is a child who is watching a horror movie child is sitting comfortably at home but while sitting comfortably at home the child starts watching a horror movie and is paralyzed terrified now the mother is right next to the child but if the mother touches the child ah! the child is screaming terrified the same monster is coming and touching me now so now as the child is watching the horror movie the mother is right next to the child and the child is sick but the consciousness of the child is projected into that horror movie so what the mother does is she changes the film that is going on the tv and she she puts there the image of she and her child having gone for a picnic and the child starts seeing the loving mother and i say hey, what is this this looks nice as compared to the horror movie that was going on and hey this is hey, this is who is this such a loving person i think i know this person the child is so scared that we not be able to process also but as the child starts feeling calmer calmer oh this is my mother and then as the child becomes calmer and calmer and then the mother touches she looks oh you're here is safe so similarly for us right now our consciousness is caught at the physical level now we are spiritual beings and inside all of us is a is a representation of divinity that is there that's like our mother next to us but we are so caught at the physical level of reality that we don't perceive the divine presence right next to us so what happens is on the inner screen we try to invoke the image of divinity in the inner screen by chanting the mantra externally on the inner screen we get spiritual sound vibration we get, get spiritual stimulus over there and as the spiritual stimulus comes up we start feeling peaceful peaceful then we start spiritual sensibility starts getting awakened and once that spiritual sensibility starts getting awakened then we will perceive the ourselves to be spiritual etra uparmate chittam niruddham yoga sevaya etra chaiva atmanatmanam pashyan atmani tushyati in the sex in the bhagavad gita chapter 20th verse krishna said in the bhagavad gita that at that time when the mind becomes peaceful then we start perceiving the self and we start delighting in the self so during the chanting of the mantra we basically try to get the sound of the mantra on our inner screen but the sound itself is spiritual the more we let that sound appear on the inner screen the more it will spiritualize our consciousness okay thank you <laughs> so maybe <laughs> okay so how does karma figure into this calculation or this reasoning of our <clears throat> how we process our events process uh, what happens in our life the word karma has many different meanings here generally what we refer to is the reaction to our karma so the kind of actions that i have done in the past they are going to give me some reactions sometimes bad things just happen to us although we have not done anything bad that is just a reaction to something bad which we have done in the past mm. now just as karma bad things may happen this like i said spiritual knowledge tells us that we are bigger than our situations and bigger than our emotions so by karma sometimes bad situations may come in our life and when those bad situations come in our life one bad thing happens and the mind may just take off from there is something we are planning to go for a outing a picnic up and then suddenly just before that the previous night we fall sick with a flu and the, and the next day we're burning with resentment and the flu it just makes us weak it makes us sleepy but the resentment why did this happen to me why did this happen to me why did this happen to me? that hurts us more than the flu so many times bad things happen to us but the resentment of that bad thing hurts us more than the bad thing also 
so by the bad karma by 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 some karma some bad thing may happen to us but how that bad thing will hurt us will depend on how our mind processes it so if our if at that time okay this has happened i accept it let me do something let me just calm myself down let me see what i can do in situation maybe i can read some book i can hear some talks i can hear some spiritual music and then i'll feel calmer but i'll feel better so the external event will bad event may happen by karma its impact on will be on me will be much lesser hmm? secondly it may also happen that by bad karma some unwanted images start coming on my inner screen for example if somebody is an alcoholic say this is the home of a person this is a home that two people are staying here and this is their office or this is their college and along the way there is a bar so one person is alcoholic the other is not alcoholic and when the alcoholic starts going by as soon as they walk by the al- bar i want to drink i know i should not drink. maybe i should drink no i should not drink his whole tug of war goes on and sometimes they may reach the class also oh i have just taken one drink you know it's been so nice their mind says locked in that bar practically speaking so in what happened the past actions are producing a reaction at the mental level for the non alcoholic who is not drunk uh, there is no temptation to there is no agitation of the mind so sometimes by the way we have acted in the past by our past karma some reactions may come at the mental level where at the mental level unwanted feelings unwanted desires unwanted ideas just start popping up too much now we have to see that this is also a reaction to karma just because something is inside me that does not mean it is me sometimes we just feel very irritable sometimes we just feel so bored with everything sometimes we just feel so depressed about everything these are just emotions that are coming on in our screen so they also can be a result of past karma so if you just tolerate them this is coming it will stay here for some time it will go so if we can distance ourselves from our situations and our emotions then the karma action will cause some suffering but our response to it will not aggravate the suffering we like to say okay this is there and i have to endure it but i don't have to em- identify with it i don't have to act on it it is something that becomes easier when we become more self aware uh, one way to understand that we are different emotions is or rather not we are necessarily different from our emotions that we are not whatever emotion pops up in our mind is we can realize this when we are trying to do something which we know is important for us but, but we don't feel like doing it so i have to study i got a exam tomorrow now i have the intention to study that's what i want to do but there is something within me come on you know let's let's look at a youtube video let's read some news let's watch some movie now when this sort of duality starts happening within us that is the time when we understand okay this is inside me but it is not me so sometimes we just when something unwanted comes up inside us we just either try to fight to get rid of it or we just fall for it no oh i am feeling so bored so i just keep persevering and doing what i am trying to do at how can i get rid of the boredom okay i start watching some entertainment and then one thing becomes second i find that i spent 6 hours in entertainment for a boredom which would have just lasted for 5 10 minutes so if we just give into the depression that's a problem if you try to fight it off also it's a problem because you know, whatever is there in the inner screen we can't get rid of thoughts are like mist you know if this mist around us there uh, you know if i try to fight the mist what do i do to fight a mist do i take a sword and fight the mist mm-hmm. when a thought is there in us we can't get rid of it if it is there it is there if i try to say i'll get this thought out of my consciousness what how will i get it out 
the only way you know unwanted thoughts unwanted desires unwanted emotions they cannot be driven out they can only be crowded out it's only when we get constructive into our consciousness that they will go out if either i if i fall for it or fight against it in both ways actually i thwart myself so what we have to do is okay this is there it is there for some time i don't want it here but it is there we don't pay attention to it it's like say if you have got a old car which you want to sell but there is no buyer available and the agent has said that you will get the buyer only after 3 months and 3 months is going to be in the garage now i can decide stupid car taking so much space in my garage so i take a iron bar and smash the car what's the use of that on the other hand it is not working so well i i keep driving in that very car and then i start beating myself why this car is so terrible it looks so terrible it functions so terrible. why do i have to drive in this car no we could just keep that car aside and rent another car buy another car or whatever that car can be there we don't have to we don't have to resent its presence we don't have to act on its presence we just allow it to be there if we focus on something else if you use some other mode of transportation once our mode of transportation is served that car's presence will not affect us so much to so similarly by past karma sometimes some unwanted emotions will come into within us they just there so that they take an unwanted car in our garage now rather than trying to get rid of them or to act on them we just continue with our life let it be there it is there and as we focus on something constructive in our life and as the constructive activities come filling our consciousness that will recede into the background so karma may cause bad situations or bad emotions to come within us but if you are practicing spirituality if you are focused on acting spiritually in our life then that purpose will prevent that that karmic reaction from creating uh, disproportionate distress in our life okay. thank you very much so maybe all of you can just speak one point which you liked and then we can conclude may some reflection of something which you would like to carry home i like that analogy of the those three levels the like three part type levels of existence how the, our body is like the hardware our mind is like the software and our soul is like the processor yeah it, it makes it very practical to understand in today's technological world <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you are a neuroscientist is it <laughs> um, this isn't related as much to the neuroscience, but I really liked um, the way you described the use because I'm also studying psychology specifically related to mental illnesses. Mm. So um, I, I, I'm really grappling with um, just in my life in general, aside from this talk, but in the past probably year or so, um, the role of psychology and psychiatry versus spirituality and things like this hand raising, like what that means. Um, mm. But I, I found it really interesting to think of healing your biology and then healing, like through psychiatry is like healing through biology, I guess, and then psychology is more for the mind, and that spirituality is taking a step beyond that, and then it's letting you see your life as something bigger. And I think that's a really beautiful way to look at it. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Very good point. Chris, you would like to say something? Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Both are valid, but we have to see what is more constructive for our purpose at that time, which approach we need to use. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yes. I think that's that's great. You told about that um, that boy who was dealing with rejection and how yeah. after he took spirituality, he could um, he could take that same bad experience, but actually transform it into a mm. spiritual, a kind of enlivening experience. That was really Yeah, it's true. Actually, there at I was studying. I gave several seminars on fear. It's the top ten fears of people in the twentieth century, nineteenth century, as far as we know, eighteenth century. In the twenty-first century, there are two new fears which have been added. One is the fear of terrorists, and the second is the fear of rejection. Mm-hmm. So, because relationships are so unstable and secure, it's a big fear. And if we have spiritual growth, then it helps us to face 
relational ups and downs much better. Thank you. Yes. I really like the last point that you said that when we have thoughts in the mind, we cannot actually directly fight with it. Mm. We just try to fill our mind with spiritual positive thoughts and then that just fades away. Yeah. And, uh, I'm actually thinking like practically like just in like day to day life when we have a thought which is like we know that we don't want to go there but still we try to like fight it that oh why am I thinking that I should not be thinking that the mind naturally tends to like fight those thoughts but yeah it's good to at the time just you know focus on something positive and just say okay I'm not just let go of it now I'm not going to think of it Come yeah sometimes you know some softwares in a computer they are like instant it's like some pop up comes up and you can't find a cross anywhere. <laughs> so, you just have to drag it aside, let it be there, <laughs> and move on with life. <laughs> so, some of our thoughts are like that. really funny. Thank you. Yes. the mind the mind tends to catastrophize problems but the intelligence can contextualize problems you know okay this is the end of my life now my life is over that's what the mind tends to say but contextualize you know if I look back at my life there are so many situations when I felt my life was over now but over a period of time I was able to deal with it so if uh, if we just you can distance our then you can say yes this is a problem and I have to deal with it but if I look back at my life five years ago ten years ago I can think of some problem which I felt my god it's going to destroy my life and almost every year we may look back there's some problem at that time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we have lived through those years <laughs> we can contextualize those problems that way okay in this situation this has come and this is, is a product of this context. It will be there for some time and it will go. So if we contextualize it, then we can yeah. don't have to get carried away by it. Right. Yeah. And the problems will never end. They will keep on coming. It is yeah. the way how we address them, what is our response to them. That's true. And, uh, and spirituality, when you think of spirituality, it helps us to put things in proper perspective mm. and be able to deal with them as they come along and not make a you know, mountain up for more days. That's true. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. I like the whole topic. <laughs> 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 that doesn't make me think, um, too, okay, because we talk about not acting on the, on the emotions and everything. But what about spiritual emotions? Because we are ultimately people, a person. So, um, oh, yeah. So, uh, so, you know, if we say we should not act on our emotions, but don't we ourselves have emotions? We are spiritual people. Yes. What I was talking about is not that uh, not that we not act on our emotions, but rather we process our emotions. 
and then decide how to respond to them and they said that there are for us certain things which are circumstantial situations and circumstantial emotions that come because of the situations and then we have four values purpose and the emotions related with that are important for us so we want to choose those emotions that lift us up spiritually and we want to avoid those emotions that pull us down so emotions are themselves not the problem it's our uncritical embracing of the emotions that is the problem so by spiritual growth the emotions that first two things happen by spiritual growth first is that our intelligence by which we can evaluate which emotion is healthy and which emotion is unhealthy we can discern that otherwise whatever emotion comes in we get carried away by that no all emotions are not unhealthy certainly not emotions are actually the ornaments of life if there were no emotions we would just be like robots and that would not be in any way a palatable life so emotions are not bad but there are short term emotions which uh, can overwhelm us there are emotions which arise from circumstances which are not really important for us so the capacity to discern which emotion is more important which emotion is less important uh, that first of all comes through our spiritual growth and secondly I, so in spiritual growth there is you could say intelligence and there is transcendence intelligence enables us to analyze the emotions and decide which are on to focus on and as we rise to transcendence as we become spiritual more and more then the unhealthy emotions itself start becoming lesser in their intensity and the healthier emotions start becoming stronger and when that happens then the inner battle goes down substantially and instead of that inner struggle there is greater inner power so at the spiritual level it is the power of love that animates us and that is extreme that the power of pure spiritual love is extremely powerful and that is that is like a powerful river which can overcome all obstacles is go straight to the ocean so like that those who are spiritually very pure and purposeful they can actually overcome great obstacles and persevere in their path so uh, emotions are not uh, not bad but is our uncritical embrace that of the emotions that of which your emotion that pops up within that is the problem so when we learn to first of all s- select the emotion or analyze the emotions and then as we nourish the healthier emotions then actually we experience greater and greater happiness okay thank you thank you very much yes um so many good points but um i guess a couple of things like seeing the well first of all um becoming the observer and accepting what's there mm um i think is really important because um but it can be really hard to do Um, so but it seems like acceptance is like a really big part of that of being able to um step back and become an observer you know it's being it's i guess it's probably yeah um, you know it's like wait you can't do one without the other sort of which came first um, not this i and as what you're saying so acceptance is how is it that we're stepping back we do the acceptance or by accepting we step back if you ask it's, it's i think it's if you see the bhagavad gita there's an example of how many rivers flow into the ocean mm. but the ocean is not disturbed so that is a example of say emotions desires coming in we don't grudge them we don't block them right. but they don't overwhelm us now imagine if instead of the ocean there is a puddle over there and if a river comes into the puddle that this will be devastation it will be flooding and everything will get disrupted so it is if our consciousness is like a puddle then if any negative emotion comes in it will be very difficult to resist it it is when our consciousness is like a ocean then when river like emotions come in river like desires come in we will be able to take them in without getting affected so the whole process of spiritual growth 
Now, what do we mean? Uh, it means to make our consciousness from a puddle to an ocean. Now, what determines the size of our consciousness? That is determined by the size of the object that the consciousness is focused on. If the consciousness is focused on small things, if say my consciousness is focused on wealth, I just want money, 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 money. And if something happens which threatens my financial security, uh, that can completely devastate me. Uh, if somebody is a consciousness focused on some sports, I was in India, there's one boy, India is a cricket mad country. <laughs> so there was one boy who told me that India lost a very important match. And he says, after that three nights I could not sleep. <laughs> now I told him those players who were playing the match, they slept. <laughs> you could <not> sleep. <laughs> so what happened was that consciousness got locked over there. So if our consciousness, the content of our consciousness, the object only the consciousness focus is small, then that causes the shrinking of our consciousness to the level of puddle. But the process of bhakti especially is meant to focus our consciousness on a supremely big reality. So the more we become attached and devoted to Krishna, the more he becomes a living and enduring presence in our consciousness, the more our consciousness expands to become like an ocean. And then when these emotions come up, there is so much, uh, uh, so much strength and security and satisfaction that is there inside that it is not difficult to just tolerate, accept this without fighting with it. So yes, stepping back is required, but it's not just stepping back. That will become a dream process. How long can I keep stepping back? Ultimately, we need to be filled with something higher. So in, we use our intelligence to step back from unwanted emotions. But then we use our devotion, we use our spirituality to fill our heart with, with, with Krishna's presence. And that's what ultimately helps us to tolerate the rivers that come in without getting affected. Okay. So thank you very much for your participation and attention. Thank you, Krishna.